good morning. Welcome to Croc Week. Can everybody say Croc? Croc. Say Croc again. Croc. You guys are going to be excited about Crocs. When you leave today, you're going to be doing the same thing that I've done for the last four days. Not sleeping because I'm dreaming about crocodiles. Whether I'm pulling up video, whether I'm pulling up facts. I want to start today in the book of Job in the 41st chapter, 12 through 17. I want to emphasize Leviathan's limbs and its enormous strength and graceful form. Who can strip off its hide and who can penetrate its double layer of armor? Who could pry open its jaws for its teeth are terrible. The scales on its back are like rows of shields tightly sealed together. They are so close together that no air can get between them. Each scale sticks tight to the next. They interlock and cannot be penetrated. Now, the King James Version says one is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together, and they cannot be sundered, as they say in the old weddings. All right, guys, it's Croc Week, and this really excites me. In Job 41 in Scripture, some scholars believe that Leviathan is a picture of a dragon. Some believe it's a picture of a serpent of some sort, and others believe it is a picture of a croc. But reality is, when you read the several Scriptures of it, this animal is probably what you would call a sea monster of some sort. It's probably Ogopogo. Because we know that the scriptures were written in Kelowna, B.C. How many people have been to Kelowna, B.C. before? How many people know the legends and the stories of the Ogopogo? If you've ever heard, for those who haven't, if you've heard of the Loch Ness Monster, Nessie, uh, you're going to have heard of Ogopogo if you've been around the Okanagan. And as a kid growing up, I lived around that area. And when we didn't live there, I would always take a one-week vacation with my granny and poppy. And when we went out, I would always be looking, whether we're fishing, I'm looking for the feature of the Ogopogo in the water. When I went by myself, I was always watching for the Ogopogo because I knew, I knew I might just get lucky enough to see Leviathan. Well, actually, I I wish I'd known that name. I thought it was very cool. Ogopogo, not so much. But because... We don't have evidence of the Ogopoco or the Loch Ness Monster today. The closest thing that we can see alive is the description of the mighty crocodile. They are the largest reptile on the planet. Some grow up to 20 feet wide and weigh more than 2,000 pounds. They actually produce tears. When they eat, they swallow too much air. It affects the glands that produce the tears, and it forces the tears to flow. But it's not actually crying. You've heard the term crocodile tears? It refers to a false, insincere display of emotion, such as someone crying fake tears of grief. They have an average lifespan from a minimum of 30 years up to 70 years, depending on the crocodilian species. And there are some claims that some have lived up to 100 years. Now, crocodiles have the strongest bite ever measured. The strongest, which is the saltwater crocodile, slams its jaws shut with 3,700 pounds per square inch, despite that enormous bite. Their muscles are so extremely small and weak to open their mouth that the average human can keep them held shut. Their top swimming speed is 15 kilometers an hour. Thank goodness, maybe some of you are quick at swimming. Crocodiles don't have sweat glands. They release the heat through their mouths and that's why they will often sleep with their mouths wide open. Now the only thing you can do if a croc catches you for some reason is you can poke it in the eye or bark it on the nose because its scales are interlocked like that 
and there is no penetrating that body armor. That's your address. Welcome to Croc Week. <laughs> what I'd like to do is we have a special guest via video today that I want us to go to to give us a little more information on crocodiles. Here's our animal kingdom expert. Let's go to the video. Welcome to the dangerous animals of the die, the crocodile. It's your animal kingdom expert here, Steve Berwin, the lesser known but more attractive of the two cousins. Over here, we have the mama crocodile in her natural environment. Luring prey, catching it for her young. Her young are in the bush somewhere in these marshes, so we gotta be super quiet. We're trying to get as close as we can without disturbing her. One thing that's very important about these animals is that we try to preserve them. Right? If we provoke them, push them too far, someone's gonna get hurt, and they're gonna be really disturbed. Oh my, oh my god, is that a woman out there? There's no way to- Somebody help her! This is your animal expert, kingdom expert, whatever. I'm out of breath from saving that woman. We all have each other's backs, but come on. Anyways, we have nature's back, nature has our back. Just don't go swimming in stupid crocodile water. Well, today we're talking about Job 41 when it refers to double layered armor. You know, the rows of shields that scare scaled together that no air can come between them. Each scale, you'll notice, sticks tightly to the next because they interlock and those scales cannot be penetrated. I believe that these scales, the interlocking of these scales should be the picture of the church. It should be the picture of your marriage, the picture of your friendships, and that's why this message today is entitled, I got your back. I got your back. Someone say, I got your back. Okay, now turn around to someone that's on your back and say, I got your back. Turn around someone to your left. I got your back. <laughs> Did you notice a croc's back is like armor? You can see layer upon layer of those different shapes. And now there's very different shapes of the scales within the different crocodilian species that interlock and that makes it such an impenetrable shield in their life. Um, even breaking it down to the most cellular levels, there is cell upon cell, layer upon layer, right up to the bony plates of the crocodile. And the truth is, in this case though today, I think we all wonder, who's got my back? When you're at work, are you not thinking, who's got my back? I feel like nobody has my back. Maybe you've been struggling, going through a marriage in your life, or you grew up and saw problems in the family, and you used to think, does anybody have anybody's back? It seems like our culture has begun to take a shift away from covering each other's back. When we've all been hurt, you've probably been backstabbed, and you felt it because you had no protection, no armor on your back. And then you begin to think, who's got my back? I don't think anyone has my back. And the truth is, whether it's on the ice playing hockey, it's on the field playing football, or in, on the pitch playing soccer, or it's in your friendship, or it's in your family, there's nothing better than knowing someone on your team, someone in your church, someone in your family, your loved one has your back. There's nothing more exciting than that. I, I, I did a study to kind of look into companies that were most successful. And one of the things that they discovered is that companies where they feel their supervisor has their back are the most productive. 
Can you imagine that? They're more productive when their coworkers have their back. They're not trying to take. They're trying to cover and take care of. So when you leave and there's something you miss, they cover your back. Those are the companies that work with each other. They become essentially what you could call a team, a team even of warriors. Let's be the type of people, let's be the type of church that you're dragging the people from their tubies out of the lake, getting them out because you got their back. And when you have someone else's back, it should look like this, interlocked together, no air coming between. To just say, I got your back, and use lip service means nothing. You need to be interlocked, joined together so you have strong armor. Let's take a look in the Urban Dictionary of I Got Your Back. It's an expression that's assuring someone that you are watching out for them. And it comes from making sure you are safe by someone is watching what's behind you while you're busy looking ahead. See, this is how the church survives and thrives, is when we let our leaders look ahead and we cover their backs. This is how your marriage survives. When the one is pushing forward, the other one is covering their back. And then when you switch off, you cover their back. You need to cover one another's back. And then it allows you to look ahead. I think a lot of times the struggle that we struggle with is the fact that we're not covering each other's back. We see the back, but it's just like we become absent-minded. And we just forget we got people who need us to cover their back. Let's look in Ephesians 6, 11 through 7. It says, put on all of God's arm, armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, when we realize who we're fighting, we stand together, back to back. And therefore it says, put on every piece of God's armor. Do you notice earlier it says all of God's armor. Now it says every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. Marriages are not standing firm. Friendships are not standing firm. Churches are not standing firm because we don't have each other's back. Thank you. We need to have one another's back at all times. But you also, it says, to put on all the armor. Not some, but it says all. Now let's look at what God's armor. When we look at God's armor here, we see the belt of truth, the body armor, or as you know, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and the word of God. But ready for the last one? Joined with warriors who have your back. You need to be joined. No warrior fights alone. God's armor is each other as well because we have each other's back. So sometimes when you start thinking through the armor of God, you miss that one essential piece, the church, God's people. You're saying, well, have you seen my church lately? Careful, careful, we're here. This is Elevate. (laughs) But the truth is, is we are human, we do sin, and that's why we need to have each other's back. Some of you just say, well, you know, there is really nothing in the armor, is there? There's nothing on your back. And truth is, is if you keep going forward, very likely nothing's going to get you from behind because the armor is offensive, to go on the offense, not to be defensive. If you've uh, seen movies, do you notice that you should not go out alone? You need to have someone to have your back. All the gun movies, the shooting them down movies, the war movies, uh, now, there's always a couple of movies where we got a superstar like Dwayne The Rock Johnson or someone else that can do it alone. But let me remind you, it's just a movie. The reason that you have nothing on your back in the armor of God is because warriors never fight alone. Warriors of God never fight alone. They always fight with someone else because they have each other's back. See, the enemy's plan is to isolate you, to pull you out. I I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, we don't need the church. Yes, you do need the church because we need to have your back. And if as a church we're not having each other's back, then we need to change what we're doing in the church. 
because we're not doing what God has called us to do, is to have each other's back. That's what we're called to do. He's going to go after your back because that's where you're most vulnerable. Let's look at Ecclesiastes in chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. It says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, have their back. You know, let's be a church that's always pulling people up, that's helping people up. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back. Two can stand back to back, and three are even better, for it's a triple braided cord that is not easily broken. That's God's plan for his church. His plan was never to leave you alone. His plan was never for you to fight alone. His plan was for you to work with one another. His plan is for you to stand back to back in your marriage when you make that covenant with one another. His plan was when you stand back to back in your friendships that you can have the David and Jonathan relationship that makes the difference in the world. That you can fulfill the purpose and the call that God has called you to because someone has your back. Just like scales on a crock together as warriors in the church, we have that protective shield like the scales on a crocodile and it forms it. And see, this is the thing. If you make a mistake, when there's trust and there's openness, a mistake is what? A mistake. Your sin is just a mistake. And if someone has your back, it will take you from that place where you were to a place of a higher calling in your life. If I make a mistake, what if I say things wrong? I'm really worried that someone's not going to have my back. Well, First Peter continues now in 1 Peter 4 and 8, and he says, and I find this so interesting, most important of all, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. We don't have time to go through what love really is. But go ahead and study it. He says to have deep love. And it says, for love covers a multitude of sins. If we have deep love in the church, you're going to be able to cover the multitude of sins that each other has. Because if you have sins in your life and you have someone that cares about you, that's, th that love will cover that multitude of sin and that person can come out of that sin. Sometimes there's so much in bondage and it's because they believe the lies that have come in, the lies that the enemy has put into their lives and they need that interlocking shield, that armor, just like a croc. They need to be croc-like and a part of that is love in their life and we need to exercise that. I pray that our church would be a church of restoration for people. I pray that our church would be a church of love, a church of loyalty, a church that when you're not doing well, it's okay. It's okay because we love you. We got your back. We got your back. Maybe, you know, you're struggling even today. You know, it's been a tough one. You're a little confused. Let's go back to back. What if you slip and fall? Hopefully, we got your back. Someone's going to be there to pick you up because that is the good news that Jesus gives us. Let's not be Christians who are leaving people in the croc-infested waters. Too many people are in those croc-infested waters and we're leaving them there and, and just walking by because we feel we don't have time and that's what we need to change. We need to be a croc church for Jesus. Having the armor fully on where we're interlocked like the scales on a croc that will protect it. Be like a Leviathan. Let's pick people up when they fall and use that love. Now Ephesians 4 in verse 16, this is talking about how the church functions and works. And he says, now he's using you. Do not think that God does not use you. That is a part of the purpose and the plan of being a Christian and connecting to God's church. And he says, fitting you, finding your right place 
in brick by brick or stone by stone. You could also say layer upon layer upon layer. It says, with Christ Jesus as a cornerstone that holds the parts together. We as a church, as we build layer upon layer. The author of Job actually tells us that no air can come between Leviathan scales. No air. Now, uh, talking about air, have you guys ever woke up one morning and gone into the kitchen and there was a funky smell? There was just something in there. And you weren't sure what it was. I remember many years ago, I actually got up one morning, I came out to the kitchen, and I smelled something. And I wasn't sure what it was. But it was funky. That's just, uh, it, it stunk. I, it was worse than a skunk. And I wasn't sure what it was. And, and so I start blaming my kids. Because obviously it's the kids' fault. And so... As I'm looking in all their rooms and I'm smelling their beds and lifting up their back ends and, you know, trying to find out where is this stink coming from? You know, I walked everywhere. And then my wife comes in from outside. And as she comes in, I said, do you smell that smell? She goes, yeah, I've been smelling that smell. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's something in the pantry. I go into the pantry and I open it up. And as I pull back a few bags, because it stunk bad in there. And I saw rotten potatoes. Now, these potatoes, I had been asked to take them out by Mary Lou several times over the last two months. And obviously, I didn't smell the stench for all that time. And that air got in. Sometimes it's just time to take out the garbage. It's time to take out the garbage, the air that's getting in between the layers between us. The, those scales are not tight, and there is air, stench that's coming into them. You know, uh, I actually find that when I focus, when I focus on something that's like air and the problems in there, it goes away. And sometimes we don't tend to focus on removing the problem. We're so focused on just moving down the road, but the hindrance is still behind us, and we need to make that change. In John 17, verses 20 and 21, I love this. He says, I am praying not only for those disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. He says, pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father and I, am in, and I am in you. In other words, there is no air. Tightly locked. No stench of air can get in. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I've been asked several times why I think the church struggles. And I believe it's because we send a wrong message to the world around us. The message we send constantly is hypocritical. It's because we say one thing on a Sunday and we do something else all week long. Or we break down in public with people, and that's okay. Maybe you did sin for a moment. But do you cover that with a multitude, a multitude of sins with your love? Do you go back? Do you apologize? Do you make it right? Do you let them know that it was not appropriate what you said and what you did? Because when you begin to do that, they begin to look at you in a whole different light. See, you are to be Jesus with flesh. You are to walk this planet, this place. You are to go to work and you are to live your life and show your neighbors and the people around you the example of Jesus. Now, you may not be perfect and that's okay. And hopefully someone will have your back. But if you don't got anyone's back, how do you expect someone to cover your back? If you're really on a mission for God, for people who need Jesus, for people who who need to find a home. We don't have time for there to be air between us. None of that stench. We just all need to be one with him who created us. One for one purpose. One for one mission. One for our future. To have no air. Think of it. What would it be like if your family had no air and it was just scale upon scale of armor? That none of that stinky air, that funky smell is going to get in. Imagine your friendships, and what they would look like if we didn't allow that funky air in. And in an increasing disloyal culture, the question is, is how do we build armor? How do you build armor in, in a very disloyal culture? 
How do we become croc-like? Well, I believe we need to build layers, and that's what we're going to wrap up today with. I'm going to give you some layers quick of protection for your life. So let's talk about layer one. Layer one is unity. So you're going to build upon layer, upon layer, upon layer. But to do that, you're going to have to build these layers. So the first is unity. Let's take a look in Ephesians 4 and again. And it says in verses 2 and 3, he says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your what? Your love. Remember your deep love, love that covers a multitude of sin. And he says, make every effort, every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. See, allowances, no allowances in your life means no friends. No faults in your life means problems. No, 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 no. When you have no faults, it means you have a great a story, a great testimony in your life that people go, wow, how do you do this? You just go, I'm not perfect by any means, but I try because I care. I love God and I love people. I love the people that he's created. So you're going to take that first layer of unity and you're going to build on that unity. That is your job. That's your job to build that first layer. Second layer you're going to put on top of it is loyalty. You're going to take unity and you're going to take another layer now into the second scale. And you're going to build now loyalty into that place. I want you to think about loyalty in Proverbs 3, Solomon speaking in verse 3 and 4. He says, never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Never, never let loyalty leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. In other words, that you are going to wear them. Wear loyalty. Write them deep within your heart. Make sure that your brain has meditated upon what loyalty is and what you need to do. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. You want to get ahead at work? Loyalty. Have unity with the people and have loyalty at work. Have loyalty to your job. In a disloyal culture, it's really tough. But see, you can step out above so many other people. When you have loyalty at work, when your employer sees loyalty, they will work with that because that's a long-term employee that will build that business. It's much easier to work with people who are loyal. Loyalty is something that's lost, but as a church, let's be crocs for Jesus, layer upon layer. So we take the layer of loyalty upon the layer of unity. The third layer you're going to put, the third scale is faithfulness. So you're going to have unity, you're going to have loyalty, and now you're going to put faithfulness. Now, get this. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, he says, find some faithful men. He says, find some faithful men. It's showing true and constant support. It's faithfulness. This is the thing. When you have faithfulness that you will do what you said that you're going to do, you're going to have friendships. Some people have struggled to really get anywhere when it comes in the church and to their ministry, and they say, everyone's holding me back. My question is, do you have unity? Do you have loyalty? Even more, do you have faithfulness? Because if you're not, how, if you have not shown your faithfulness, I, I'm not going to just entrust you with anything. If I hire a staff, I need to know that they're going to be faithful if I'm going to give them more responsibility. The fourth layer you're going to move to is trust. It's the layer of trust. So you've taken unity, you've taken loyalty, you've taken faithfulness, and now you're going to put trust. You're going to put trust in place. Let's go back to Proverbs 31, verse 10 and 11. He says, who can find a virtuous and a capable wife? This is wisdom. He says, she is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her, and she will greatly enrich his life. Now, something, let's get that context to what's happening This woman that is a virtuous and a capable wife means she has gone out of her way. She is taking care of the house expenses. She's not trying to just spend it frivolously. She's doing everything she can. Even when she has downtime, she's doing what she can to make things happy, whether it's for the kids, whether it was for the husband. It didn't matter. That was a virtue. She went above and beyond and above and beyond and above and beyond because she had everybody's back. 
She had everybody's back. She was able to be trusted. And when you have trust, you have a shield. You have a shield that can't be broke. And that's why the mistake is just a mistake at that point in life. Let's have that croc trust in our life where we can say, I got your back. And the last layer you're going to put on there is the covenant. It's a covenant. The last layer is a covenant in your life. It's trust with a commitment attached. It's trust with a promise is really what it is. And I already know that you've probably been very loyal and faithful in most things in your life. But the question is, is there any air between all of those pieces? Is Between one of those layers, if it's not intact, there will be some funky air that gets in and it won't be interlocked and your armor will be able to be penetrated. We know that God was loyal and faithful to the point where he could say, I promise to you to this day that you can have eternal life. And it happens in the church. This happens when we actually say, this is my church. These are my pastors. These are my leaders. These are my friends who I serve aside every day. I belong here, and I'm going to stand back to back with each other. I'm going to have your back. I'm going to take care of you. If you ha- you're, you're, you're struggling, you're struggling. It's okay. But I got your back. I'm going to be trustworthy. I'm going to be loyal. If we just build layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. As we build layer upon layer, we make a decision to be a croc for Jesus. To have that double layers of shield, protective. Because when we have that, we begin to function as the church was called to function. The truth is, is God, he's always been faithful to us. He's got a covenant with us because he's a covenant keeping God. And his covenant went all the way to the cross. And that's when Jesus laid down his life and he paid for a price that we could not pay. But he always keeps his covenant. His last words were, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because Jesus is saying, I got your back. It didn't matter what happened to you. It didn't matter what you did. I got your back. I know you can't trust. I know it's tough. But step by step, if we'll just take that step and the next step and the next step and allow God to work in our lives, we will build layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of an armor that cannot be penetrated. An armor where we can really say we got each other's back. I think we're tired of living a life where we don't feel someone has our back. In this disloyal culture, this world that we serve, the greatest confidence you have is to know that someone has your back. The one thing that can always get me through is because I know God has my back. But you know, Jesus came and Jesus went and he built his church so that now you and I can have one another's back. Today isn't about someone having your back. It's about first you having someone else's back. Do you have someone else's back? When you take unity, when you take loyalty, faithfulness, trust, and then you put a covenant on top, a commitment, life begins to drastically change. Father, today, we pray, God, that we would build layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, that we would take a crock-like armor, scales that are interlocked, that no air can come between them. God, today may we have that kind of protection. Father, I pray that even today that you would put others on our mind, that you would just quicken them to us. If they need for us to pray for them, if they need a call, uh, God, there's someone that may be having a tough day or a tough moment and they need someone to have their back. God, send us. Such a strong prayer, but send us to have their back. 
And God, for those that might be here and they have suffered so much pain from constantly people not having their back, from stabbing them in the back, the anger, the frustration that they have. God, I pray today that you would begin to minister to them. That even as they're calling out in their heart of hearts, Lord, help me. God, may you give them strength. May you give them your power. I pray, God, that they would sense your peace, that it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. We thank you, God. You know, and as we're praying today, with every eye still closed, and if you're here today and you're at that place, and may, maybe you serve God, but at this stage of your life, God has had your back. And even though you have turned away from Jesus, he still has your back. And if that's you today, I want to give you a chance to just say, God, forgive me. Just say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for walking away. Forgive me, Jesus, for just forgetting what you've done for me. And today, Jesus, I have your back because I'm going to follow you. If that's you today, just reach out your hand to him and just say, God, thank you. I'm going to follow you all of my days. All of my days. Father, we thank you this week. We thank you as we go forward and as we try to build the layer upon layer, just quicken to our minds what we've heard today. May we remember to be crock-like with that double layer of armor that nothing can penetrate us, God, and that we will not be isolated by fighting side by side in all that we face. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Give God a hand, give God a hand. Amen.